Coming up on 9 minutes after 7 o'clock here on Sky 99.5 FM. And welcome inside our number 2 of the Breakfast Roundtable for today, Tuesday, October the 11th, 2016. Uh, Time for us to switch focus now and look at the story that um, may have slipped a few people um, in the midst of all the drama surrounding the 2017 budget and uh, the ensuing budget debate. Uh, It is a story in which a, a, a landmark decision was made by a high court judge and uh, this decision would have been uh, for people who were appealing the now defunct bail amendment bill their incarceration under that um, defunct bail amendment bill and the judge said the legislation was unconstitutional hmm there are some serious implications for that and um, remember at the time when the uh, the legislation lapsed in the Parliament uh, there were all sorts of um, uh, claims of doom and gloom uh, coming to the to the justice system in particular uh, with regard to this uh, warnings sent by the attorney general uh, in this regard. To put things in perspective for us is uh, senior attorney at law and member of the Police Service Commission, Martin George. Good morning to you, Martin George. Hi, good morning, good morning Mr. Mr. George. And good morning to your panel. Good morning, Edison. Good morning, Dr. Wayne. And yes. good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. Yes. Now, Martin George, this is this is what you would call a landmark case, isn't it? Yes, certainly it is because the effect of this legislation had such a wide reaching, you know, consequence that um, you know, for the judge to give this ruling, um, I think there are lots of people who certainly would be um, you know, scurrying to their attorneys for some advice and guidance moving forward. Mm-hmm. Now let's look at exactly um, what 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 the judge has said, um, and it's it's a case in which uh, two police officers were accused of accepting a bribe. There was another case where a 21-year-old student was denied bail for 120 days after being jointly charged for illegal possession of a gun found at her boyfriend's home. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, the thing is, you see, remember the way the legislation is, was framed. Um, it was framed in such a manner that if at all you are charged for any offense while in possession of a firearm, mm-hmm. you know, then, you know, you automatically fell within the provisions of, um, you know, this law and you will therefore deny bail um for 120 days. You know, uh, and that would be options. in possession of an illegal firearm, Mr. George. No, that's the thing. <laughs> you mean that's if you had a licensed thing. firearm and you were arrested for some other infraction? No, listen listen to me. And, and that, that's the important aspect of it. That's the important aspect of it. The legislation did not define that. They did not specify that. So that's why you had police officers who would have been carrying their service revolvers Mm -hmm. who were caught by this. And if Mm -hmm. you recall, um, Chief Magistrate Master Air Caesar was called upon to make a determination in relation to um, police officers who had come before her and who had been denied bail. And she, upon looking at it, she made the determination on her own, of her own volition, that, look, it could not make sense yes. for it to, um, you know, apply to someone who has a licensed and registered firearm, right? So the thing is, she made that determination, but the legislation of itself never did. So that's why you would notice in, the, in these cases, one of the officers, one of the persons who actually filed was a police officer. And it was not in relation to an illegal firearm. You're talking about a situation where you are there with your service revolver. So that's why, you know, um, it, it really it really struck a chord, you know, whereby people felt, well, look, there, there has to be something wrong with the wording of this legislation, separate and apart from the fundamental rights and freedom provisions of the Constitution, which it would have infringed. You know, um, so the judge then went to that aspect and said, well, look, 
in the circumstances where they have not met the aims or objectives of the legislation and it appeared now to be capricious and arbitrary a denial of someone's rights and freedoms as set out in the Constitution under Section 4. And as a result, she held that the law was unconstitutional. The thing is, it's puzzling, Mr. George, that um, the Parliament didn't realize what they were doing. And could this simply have been just a matter of an oversight? Or was this deliberately well, I mean, crafted you know, that way? If, if we recall, um, the greatest parliamentary oversight we've had in the history of Trinidad and Tobago was Section 34, where both sides of the mm. parliament, you know, willingly and apparently knowingly went into this thing. And then afterwards, when, you know, um, it hit the fan, you know, they, they, they all sought to distance themselves from it, you know, and blame each other as um, usually occurs um, with our um, political elite in Trinidad and Tobago. So the thing is, I don't know if it was, excuse me, with the greatest of respect, um, parliamentary oversight. I mean, I, I would imagine the parliamentarians would be the ones to um, make that explanation, but I, I couldn't be so bold as to presume to suggest that on their behalf. You know, but the thing is, clearly, um, something was fundamentally wrong from the get-go. If it is that you had scenarios where persons who are lawful holders of firearm users licenses or, you know, um, even an FUEC, a firearm users employee certificate, and then um, you are caught under that legislation where even if the offense does not involve the use of the firearm, that's the thing. Yes. Yes. Even if it does not involve the use of the firearm. So, you know, it, it, in several aspects, um, I guess in an attempt to be, you know, an, a sweeping piece of legislation and a catch-all, um, I, I think they probably threw the net way too wide. And as a result, the court said that, look, you are now, you know, overreaching. And you are now infringing on personal constitutional rights. Now, one of the one of the issues was this whole issue of holding someone um, without bail for 120 days. Uh, that was a, was a, was a very sticky point at the time that the uh, legislation was was being argued about and discussed and debated. Uh, many felt that that was you know that was unconstitutional. That was against uh, uh, people's rights. And we have uh, Justice uh, Carol Gobin upholding that assessment in this ruling, don't we? Yes, indeed. And, you know, the thing is, I mean, while we are struggling and grappling with solutions to the menace and scourge of crime in Trinidad and Tobago, and while, of course, you always need the legislative underpinning to give that support to your law enforcement agencies, I think we have to be careful to, you know, not seek to try to legislate a solution for crime because it's never possible to do so because no matter how many laws you have in your books, if you don't have police officers getting out of the stations, going out there and doing the groundwork, then it will never happen. If police officers want to sit and remain in their nice air-conditioned stations, you know, with, um, you know, cable channels on and, you know, they have their quarters where they can sleep and relax and, you know, you order in KFC as, as you like, you know, then it, it really makes it difficult regardless of what legislation you put there. So the thing is, we, we must never remove that responsibility, that fundamental responsibility of policing from the police service, you know, while, of course, we give the legislative support. We have to ensure that they recognize the primary and fundamental responsibility is there alone. The thing is, uh, Mr. George, why has this not happened? I mean, we we, we had um, uh, Gibbs and Iwatsky, you know, literally throwing the police officers out of the, the stations, as the case might be, because, I mean, there were, there were um, complaints from the public. You know, you go to the, the police station, there's nobody there because they, they're supposed to be on the road, whether they are walking, well, you never see that, and um, doing the wrongs of the squad cars and so on. Yet, um, from commissioner to commissioner to commissioner, most of the times, um, they don't seem to be able to, to get that public presence of the police officers on the road at all. Right. So part of the problem appears to me, um, respectfully, to be the fact that for 
decades, we have not been able to have a police service that effectively polices itself. And I've said repeatedly, there is need immediately for a strong, robust, and pervasive internal investigations unit Mm -hmm. within the police service. I've given you all the example before. In, um, you know, I I spent some time, you know, with a friend of mine, um, you know, at the Toronto Police Headquarters. And, you know, he was able to tell me, he said, listen, here in our headquarters, we have thousands of officers. And he said, you you may have hundreds of internal affairs officers and nobody knows who they are Mm -hmm. because they are working alongside you as a normal police officer, but they are part of the internal affairs unit. They are observing what is going on. So when police officers are doing wrong, these same internal affairs officers are reporting on them. They are gathering the evidence and they are prosecuting the matters. Look at what happened in Oklahoma with that police officer who shot the, um, the unarmed black man, right? You had her charged, arrested, um, you know, jailed, Bail, Pronto. and now a trial date has been fixed, and all of that has happened in two weeks. Yes. In two weeks. Mm-hmm. Will that ever happen in Trinidad and Tobago? Two years will go by, and they will still tell you it's still under investigation. And then they will tell you further that they can't divulge details because it's at a sensitive mm-hmm. stage. That's the kind of claptrap we've been given when you have issues with internal investigations of police wrongdoing. And that is the fundamental part of the problem. Because if you are not able to police or guard yourself against yourself, then the rot continues and it spreads throughout the service. And therefore you are never able to manage it with any effect at all. And that is the fundamental problem. And you see, unless and until the police service begins that kind of introspection and looking within to realize, well, look, we are part of the problem, then you will never find a solution to crime and criminality in Trinidad and Tobago. But what about what about the role of the Professional Standards Bureau? I mean, where do they come in? Well, the Professional Standards Bureau, they have been doing their part, but still they are not able to have the freedom or the full authority and license to do what they need to do. And then, unfortunately, mm-hmm. they come in after the fact. So it's only after someone other than them has made a charge or a complaint or something, then they get involved. But when you're talking about an internal affairs unit, you are talking basically, I mean, you know, to put it at its simplest, just me, you're talking having police officers spying on other police officers. Unfortunately, that, that's, that, that, that's as simply as I can put it. But that's what you need, because unless you have persons within the organization who are there within the belly of the beast, so to speak, to be able to see and report on the root of the corruption, you will never be able to get rid of it. You have to have persons within the organization who are saying, well, look, um, I observed this, I heard this, you all check this out, investigate this. This officer, um, you know, was heard planning this or intending to do that. Check it. Then you will be able to stop things and then you'll be able to police yourself. But the thing is, we have developed a culture whereby, um, you know, they, they, they become almost like untouchable within the service. And the thing is, if you have that being created, then even when it goes all the way to the top, even maybe to the office of the commissioner, he may see, well, look, um, you know, maybe I ought not to do anything because the association may get involved and they may march and, you know, they may protest and they may, you know, call a press conference. And, you know, so the thing is, as a result, you have a crisis of paralysis within the service whereby Everyone is afraid to tackle the elephant in the room, which is the corruption and the wrongdoing within the belly of the beast, within the police service itself. You know, there's always a talk of a shortage of, of officers, you know, because when people say, well, you know, the people, the officers, the police officers are not visible and so on. But the thing is, I know that I don't know how, what the figures are like, but you have so many police officers now as court prosecutors. 
Well, that's another thing that I have spoken about um, repeatedly, and I have said that no police officer should be prosecuting any matter in any court in Trinidad and Tobago. There are more than enough young attorneys, you know, um, being chilled out by the hundreds, if not yes. thousands, every year. So you can have these persons being employed by the state, the DPP department, which is the state prosecutorial arm, and have them do the prosecution because these police officers, while um, they try their best in many cases, quite a few of them are not able to, um, you know, have that legal background or proper training to be able to deal with any, you know, major legal issue, any serious legal submission. So it really, I agree with you, it is a waste of manpower, it is a waste of time doing that. And this is in no way to discredit the good work that is done by several of the police prosecutors. But the point is their talents, resources, and energies could be diverted and used elsewhere within the police service for actual police work. And that function should be devolved to attorneys who have graduated and who are employed by the DPP department. Um, that's that's a that's a whole other um, conversation, um, but I just want to get back to to the the key issue that we started speaking about, which is the now defunct bail amendment bill, and the fact that we may see the courts being flooded with cases like those that Justice Gobin ruled on recently, um, where people are going to be challenging uh, the the constitutionality of their detainment under that piece of legislation. And what that could mean, because um, the state, it is, it is believed that the state may find itself having to pay millions and millions of dollars to these aggrieved people, and we're not even looking at those who are, you know, uh, in in remand, as it were. Yet, is this is this a, a, a um, some sort of a big explosion, just waiting to happen, a ticking time bomb? Well, I would think so. And, you know, part of the interesting aspect of this matter is that um, when you look at the lineup of attorneys who appeared for um, the claimants in the matter, um, one would have seen a former attorney general. Yes. Um, and I think that it actually, while his... Um, I think it would have been under him, government. he would have been responsible for the legislation. While party was in government, yes. that the legislation was passed. So, you know, it's, it's quite interesting how these things play out in Trinidad and Tobago, that you are able to come thereafter and now uh, claim that the same legislation was unconstitutional. and Which you piloted. And, you know, um, <laughs> you know, champion a victory, you know, um, for your, your client. And then um, I think I was also the leader of the opposition um, claiming that, um, you know, they were vindicated um, by this decision of the courts. Um, but, you know, the thing is, um, it, it just speaks to the hollowness of our politics and our politicians in Trinidad and Tobago, whereby there, there appears to be no moral center. And, uh, you know, um, I, I really think um, our former prime minister, uh, Mr. Basio Pandey, really, I, I, I get he analyzed and assessed our scenario here in Trinidad and Tobago correctly when he said that politics has a morality of its own. Yes. I, I think certainly he meant, um, you know, for what he has observed in Trinidad and Tobago, and I guess maybe, um, you know, he, he felt that that was the way that it, it was here, you know, um, because the thing is, yeah, th there, there seems to be no call into account in terms of a moral responsibility to say, well, hey, listen, how... Can you now be championing this as a victory when this was legislation that your government piloted and passed? And at that time, you were proclaiming it as the right thing to do. And, and, and used, it, it, used it during a state of emergency, didn't they? To you. Right, yeah. They, um, they also did an SOE. You know, but I mean, that, that was a different um, scenario. But, you know, the thing is, so, you know, um, while, yes, I mean, of course, the, the legal position is the legal position, and no one can fault you for ever taking a legal position. But I, I always wonder if there isn't supposed to also be a moral aspect um, to the politics, 
you know, um, and the, the, the reason why I say the politics, because if you were functioning strictly as an attorney at law, then there's no problem with you one day taking one position legally and then another day taking another position mm-hmm. legally if it is that you have done further research and you said, well, look, I've discovered new cases, new authorities, then, then that kind of thing happens. But you see, as a politician where you have that responsibility to the country, I have always felt that your duty must rise above the partisan, you know, um, back and forth of, 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 of the politics of the day. And there must be some point where you are called upon to account to the nation, not just to your party. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, though, isn't there something ethically wrong with the person responsible for piloting the legislation through Parliament now coming as an attorney to fight against it? Well, isn't that some sort of? I mean, you, you see, um, I mean, the, the first thing I would say is that you know, um, in terms of the ethics and politics, um, it appears that they they don't reside in the same house in Trinidad and Tobago. That that's that's as simply as I can put it. Mm. Um, the state is being made not only to pay damages but also the legal costs. Um, for those involved in this landmark case. And, um, you know, this is, I mean, this has huge implications that many people are missing, Martin George. I I, I think so. Um, And it's only when the cases start hitting the courts, um, you know, in a flurry, um, I think people would realize that, look, um, you know, there, there is a problem here. You know, they mm-hmm. realize there is a problem here. And, of course, the responsibility and accountability um, may never come. It may never come. It never came in Section 34, you know. It never came in Section 34. We had a former minister, um, Hubert Balney, coming forth and doing a mea culpa. Uh, but as to the believability of that, um, you know, there are persons who still uh, raise questions um, in relation to that or whether he was just being made a fall guy in the circumstance. But as you raise that um, issue of Section 34, when it comes to dealing with the with the, with the backlog of cases and, and the horrible situation in Remand Yard, uh, I think I remember reading somewhere where in, in one of the bits of legislation that the Attorney General would be piling, piloting in this uh, session of Parliament that um, there may they may have to present something like a Section 34 uh, in order to deal with that with that scenario. People who have been in remand for 10, 11, 12, maybe even 15 years waiting for their cases to actually begin in the courts. Well, the thing is, um, I would imagine it would be worded a bit more carefully mm-hmm. and more craftily than um, Section 34, which, you know, represented, again, a broad brush approach. And you see, the thing is, when, 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 you, when you do that, broad brush and, you know, wide sweeping approach, you end up usually with clumsy and inelegant legislation that, of course, just is, is a minefield for persons who wish to, you know, poke loopholes in it. And as a result, they go to the courts and they're able to say, well, hey, listen, you know, um, I'm using this clause to as my escape card, my get out of jail free card. Mm. And you can't blame them for doing so. So therefore, you know, um, real legislation and that really ought not to be rushed. It ought not to be, you know, a um, uh, 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 half, half, half big duck. You, you really mm. ought to take your time and ensure that you have the widest possible consultation and input from all stakeholders before you move forward with that. But Mr. George, would you say that in these times, you know, these savage times, that but that legislation like you know the bail bill and even something like a gun court are absolutely necessary? Well, the thing is, they can be, but you see, the thing is, I, I, I again want to put them in context. They have to be mechanisms. They are really just support mechanisms. What we've had basically is our leaders have touted these things almost as if they are the solution, as if it's a magic silver bullet or a cure-all for crime. And that's never the case. What you have is you create a legislative framework whereby the law enforcement agencies are able to effectively do their job. But it does not ever take away that fundamental responsibility from the law enforcement agencies. And that's why I think we keep missing the boat. We keep thinking that, you know, if you just enact 
yes. the legislation that that does it look look for instance with, with the with the anti gang legislation remember the disaster that that is yes. to be yes. because the law enforcement agencies never went out and actually tried to fulfill the basic requirements of the law itself the law required that you must be able to establish that a person was a gang member or a gang leader and they they gave certain indicia you know either they had um certain brands or markings or signs or you know codes or secret passwords or whatever nobody ever went out and did any undercover work or any investigative game. In fact, you, you wonder if anybody in Trinidad and Tobago um, in our law enforcement agency still does undercover work or, or detect because that is hard, tedious, tiring work. Nobody wants that. Everybody wants to drive around in an SUV, air conditioned, and you know, um, be toting these big long rifles as if they're going to start the Third World War and doing nothing when it comes to investigating and detecting crime. And that remains our fundamental problem in Trinidad and Tobago. Look how many murders we've had for the year. How many of them have been solved? Ask yourself that. Then you realize that we will never make any progress once we continue along this path. You could put all the laws in place, Edison. All the laws in place, Dr. Wayne. But if you don't have your law enforcement officers going out and doing the hard work, the ground work on to get the police officers out of the station, onto the ground, going out into the communities, out of the nice air-conditioned SUVs, going out there, mingling with the people on the ground, getting the information. We will never make any progress. Mm. Martin George, we have to leave it there for now. Um, and we really appreciate you squeezing us in this morning on this particular issue. We'll continue to monitor it and see what develops as time goes on. Thank, Thank you. you. It's always a pleasure. And good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. Martin George, a senior attorney at law and member of the Police Service Commission, uh, weighing in on a recent judgment that could have major implications um, for the justice system. Keep it here. Don't touch a button. We'll be right back with more on Sky 99.1.